we'll get started. I'm, I'm hoping everyone's following along here. We're looking at the title page here. Um, but skipping ahead, uh, what I want to talk about today was species diversity in the genus Amelanchier. Now, now this is actually a talk, um, a similar talk I gave a few months ago to a group of, of nursery growers from across the province at uh, Landscape Ontario's Grower Symposium. And it's kind of timely right now because I know despite the cold rainy day we're experiencing today, all of the Amelanchiers or service berries will soon be blooming in the Arboretum and throughout uh, the Guelph area. So, Amelanchiers. Some of you know that term, uh, others you, you may not be familiar with, but Amelanchiers go by all sorts of different common names. So around here we often call them service berries, um, further west Saskatoon berries, sarvis trees, shad bushes, shad woods, shad blows, sarvis berry, sugar plums, chuckly pears, june berries are just a few of the names. Um, and that covers a, a number of different species that can look very similar at the surface. So similar blooms that you're seeing here. Now, before we talk about amelanchier diversity, we're in Canada. So we're gonna talk a little bit about maple diversity. Now, um, I know I can't actually hear any of you right now. And normally I would ask if you had any guesses of how many species of maple we actually have here in Canada. And I guess we think again, being Canada, the uh, maple leaf on the Canadian flag, we probably have quite a few. Um, and we do, we have about 11 of them. Um, that number fluctuates up and down by one or two species, depending on how ta taxonomists group them. So sometimes they lump them together and, and include black maples as a subspecies of sugar maple, for example. But some of the uh, common ones you would know are again, sugar maple, uh, silver maple, red maple, Freeman's maple, uh, black maple. Uh, some smaller ones like striped maple and mountain maple, some west coast species like uh, Douglas maple and Rocky Mountain maple and uh, big leaf maple and vine maple. Um, so some, some fair diversity here. However, when we contrast that to another country of a similar size to Canada, China, there are 147 species of maples. So Canada has absolutely beautiful forests and incredible flora. But sometimes we lack the species diversity of other countries. Uh, a big part of that was because much of Canada or all of Canada for the most part was, was covered in a massive ice sheet about 12,000 years ago. So a lot of species have been slowly migrating up since that time. And well, what we're seeing right now is, is what has uh, essentially come up from refuge sites further south um, over the past few thousand years. But looking at Amelanchier diversity, we're going to go in the other direction and look at China. They have two species. So China is, is super rich in diversity of all sorts of plants. Um, you know, botanists envy being able to go into the interior sites to look at again, hundreds of species of maples and hundreds of species of magnolias and all these incredible things, but they only have two species of Amelanchier. And we contrast that with Canada and we have 24. And that includes some varieties and some hybrids that are common uh, in the wild as well. So Canada is actually an incredible hotspot for Amelanchier diversity, essentially the, the greatest in the world. And it's a really um, misunderstood group of plants that has so much more potential for us to get to know. Now here's a list of some of the ones that you'll see. Looking at the uh, left screen there, you can see in Ontario a whole slew of different species that you'll find uh, growing in the wild if you look closely. Uh, the remainder of Canada, uh, chiefly the East Coast, there's a couple species there um, that we don't have in Ontario, a few species I should say. Uh, some of them are actually quite globally rare, such as Amelanchier gaspensis and Nantucketensis. And then if you look at the US, there's a few more species that they add that we don't have here. But in Europe, there's only five, including a hybrid. Um, and there's only two in, in Asia. So really, Ontario is, is so, so rich in this really interesting group of plants. Now, for all of you gardeners out there, you are familiar with service berries and amelanchiers, and you will visit garden centers and you will see them there. Um, they are very durable plants. However, most of what you see really only focuses on four of these species. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's a few cultivars that you see kind of over and over again. So the bottom of the list here, amelanchier grandiflora, um, autumn brilliance is very common in garden centers right now. Um, obelisk, which is often called standing ovation, um, which is a cultivar of Amelanchier almifolia, uh, or Saskatoon berry is fairly common as well. But um, 
it, it's often a, a smaller selection of these plants that we actually see available for sale. Now, why is it important to know the difference between amelanchiers? So we can look at them and we say, you know what, they're very similar. They all have berries that are generally similar in size, uh, similar in color. They might range from a, a red to more of a, uh, a purple maroon color. Um, but, but very similar characteristics, um, not quite as different as you'd see in some of the maple species where, where the maple keys can look very different from one another. Uh, things like the bark, uh, it can vary certainly depending on the size of the stem, but generally it's smooth and gray. The buds, as you can see on the right here, are generally small and pointed, nothing that really stands out about them. And the leaves, we have three different species here. And they all have that kind of similar teardrop shape of leaf. Some of them might be a bit fuzzier, some of them ha might have bigger teeth or smaller teeth, but again it's not like looking at the difference between a, uh, a red oak leaf and a white oak leaf, for example. And then here are nine different species in flower. So they all tend to share white flowers, so they do look very very similar. So again this brings us to the question, well is it important for us to know the difference between them? Um, if they all kind of look the same, they all have red berries and white flowers and gray bark, maybe it doesn't matter that, um, that we're uh, paying more attention to what we're growing or planting. Now, there is reasons why we want to know the differences between these things, and I'm going to get into that a little bit. But one of the main reasons we don't see more of them in garden centers is because they're notoriously tricky to tell apart. They're very, very difficult to distinguish. And in some cases, you can only accurately tell them apart during the bloom season, which is coming up very soon. So I hope that uh, if you do get outside for walks anytime in the next couple of weeks, you can start to look at the flowers as they open up. And one of the first things I describe to people who are trying to tell different animal anchors apart is to look very closely at the flowers when they're blooming and look at the ovary summit. So the ovary summit is basically the tip of the ovary, which is in the center of each of these blooms here. Now I'm not sure if, if uh, if all of you can see my, my arrow cursor as I'm moving, can maybe some, you nod your heads, anyone I can see on screen to say yes? Okay, great. So it's fun to make sure you can see that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in here a little bit on this one. And if you look really closely at this ovary summit here, the tip of it, it's very smooth. Okay, so there's no fuzzy hairs on it. There's a little bit of pollen that's dropped into there, but generally it's quite smooth. And if you look at this one here, it's very, very fuzzy and pubescent. So right there, if you look at the amelanchiers when they're blooming, you can break them down into groups that either have very fuzzy, hairy ovary summits or very smooth ovary summits. And that's the way you can group them and start to tell the species apart. And this is very important. Uh, other things that you would look at that may be important in some species would be the the shape of the oversummer, whether it's rounded or more cone-shaped, and even looking at the color of, of um, the, the reproductive portions, so the anthers and the stamens. Now, once you've determined whether you have a smooth summit or a fuzzy ovary summit, you can actually break it down into groups. And this is again really important. So these are all the species that have a smooth ovary summit. And generally speaking, these are all the larger tree or shrub size species. So when I say shrub, large shrubs um, or very, very uh, substantial trees. And of course, when you're collecting seed from a young one or you're buying a young one at the nursery, you want to make sure that you're getting a tree uh, or you want to make sure you're getting something much smaller. So it's important to know the difference. And with the trees um, species, again, with these smooth ovary summits, you can break these down into two groups based upon uh, the, the structure of the flowers or the racemes that we're seeing here. So with the species on the left here, Amelanchier lavis, which is often called Allegheny serviceberry, Amelanchier borea, which is often called downy serviceberry, and Amelanchier grandiflora, which is the hybrid between the two, they tend to have the smooth ovary summit and then these very long uh, flower stalks. So this essentially makes the, the clusters look very, very open. And Amelanchier canadensis, which is the Canada service berry, and Amelanchier intermedia tend to have them clustered much more tightly together. So right there we've taken several dozen species and we've broken them down into three on one side and two on the other just by looking at a couple features. 
Now I know Rick is in the room, so he will recognize this photo. This is Rick's, this is Rick's front yard. So this is a, a pretty remarkable example of a Allegheny service berry, Amelanchier lavis. And the reason I'm showing this photo is to see the size of this particular species here. Uh, they can get quite big and be absolutely incredibly beautiful. This is an example of Amelanchier arborea, or the downy service berry. This one's growing in the wild, and this actually looks bigger than, than the picture may show. This is a fairly substantial tree, especially when we consider service berries to be plants we often see in mall parking lots and things like that. So this can get quite big. And this photo, in particular on the right here with the reddish leaves, this is Amelanchier grandiflora, which again is the, the natural hybrid between those two species. And this is a big tree. Um, so again, this is something you'd make, you'd want to make sure you have room for when you plant it. Uh, the other thing I'll just note about this photo, just uh, because most, most people won't get the chance to see these, but uh, two of these trees here, this one here and this one here, are, are two of the last remaining handful of cherry birch that exist in the wild in Canada. So this is an endangered species. And these are a few that are left um, from what used to be dozens a few decades ago and which used to be uh, close to 100 back in the 1930s. Um, so any of you who are in the uh, plant nursery group on Thursday mornings have probably had your hands on some of the seedling offspring from, from these two trees. Um, so that's something that we've been growing as part of a, a stewardship uh, program in partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Now getting back to the service berries here. Um, now we've determined that the, the large tree size ones like Amelanchier lavis and Amelanchier arborea have smooth ovary summits and they have uh, big open clusters of flowers, but these ones are often mixed up as well. So the only reliable way to tell them apart is again when they are flowering. Uh, and when they are flowering, you will find that Amelanchier arborea here on the left has leaves that are just barely opening up and they're very, very fuzzy. So this leads to the name downy service berry. Whereas Amelanchier lavis, when the flowers are, are open, the leaves are actually quite open as well. They generally have this kind of reddish tinge and the leaves are quite smooth. So another common name for this species is smooth service berry. And at this time of year, you, you look at the two and you say, wow, those are really easy to tell apart. If you wait about three weeks after that and for the rest of the summer, they look almost identical. Um, so again, you might ask the question, why is it important to tell those two apart? Um, now, depending on what you're looking for, they have different features and, and different growing conditions. So we have Amelanchier lavis here, a small one in our collection, and this is a wild um, Amelanchier arborea growing uh, in the Niagara region. And you can definitely see a little bit of a difference in the texture, the reddish backdrop of the leaves here versus the more kind of grayish green, very closed leaves on arborea. Um, personally speaking, if I was uh, growing a young one, I would want to know that it's Amelanchier lavis because I really like the color of those, those red leaves, the white flowers. Uh, the contrast is quite beautiful. And the berries are quite robust and tasty as well. But another important reason to, to know this plant is that these plants love growing in limestone. Um, so in particular, Guelph, many of you gardeners know that we have soils with a high pH, very alkaline soils. And you can find Amelanchier lavis growing in the wild right along the, the uh, Niagara escarpment, um, sometimes right out of limestone rock. So it is uh, quite, quite tolerant of those conditions. To contrast that, Amelanchier arborea likes the exact opposite. It likes low pH acidic soils. You will often find it growing out of granite rocks along the Canadian Shield and really sandy uh, soil conditions like this one in, in Niagara region. So again, um, you'd want to make uh, that right choice. Um, there's an amelanchier that's almost perfect for every situation, and, and this is why it's uh, really nice to know what you're starting with. Now moving forward, I'm going to zoom in again to this one. We're looking at a bloom up close, and you can see that really, really dense white hairiness or pubescence on that ovary summit. So now we're dealing with another group of the, the service berries. And how do you tell those ones apart? Now this can be a little bit trickier. And unfortunately, there's never just one thing that works. Um, so again, there's other species where you can look at the fruit or you might be able to look at the buds or the leaf and say, hey, I know that that is leatherwood for sure, or I know that is a Baroque. Um, with service berries, uh, especially the tricky ones, you sometimes need to look at multiple features to, to ensure things. So again, you're looking at the flowers, you're looking at the ovaries, and then you might wanna start looking at some leaf characters as well. And some of them get to be pretty precise. So you might be looking at the base of the leaf where it meets the leaf stalk or the petiole, and you wanna look to see if it's rounded 
or it might be heart-shaped here, which is called chordate. Um, you may see them be cuneate, which means they're kind of more of a, you'd have more of a wedge shape coming out here. Um, looking more closely at the leaves here, you can see the difference in um, the underside is really fuzzy in this one. It's quite smooth in this one. The teeth, so zooming in here, we see that the teeth are quite fine. This is called serrate. And if you look really closely where the veins come out before they actually meet the edge, they anastomize. So that's another botanical term that means they kind of disappear before they, they hit the edge of the leaf. And looking at this particular species, you can see that the veins, if you look really close, they actually almost all reach out towards the tip of the tooth. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. And here the, the teeth are much bigger, so this would be called dentate. So like, like teeth versus serrate, which would be more like saw teeth. And again, this is really kind of technical stuff, but this is how taxonomists have been working on this group for years to try to tell some of them apart. Other features that you know definitely go unnoticed for the most part, but are actually quite interesting when you look up close are things like the sepals. So the sepals here are at the base of the flowers, they're these green appendages. And you may want to look to see whether they are fuzzy, whether they actually have teeth on the edges as well, as well. Or in this case, we can see that they're actually curled back. This one, they're, they're erect. And that's a way that you can tell different species apart as well. So again, that seems like a lot of detail. Why is that important? This species here, this is Amelanchier humilis, um, one of the low service berries. So this is very, very different than those tall tree ones that we looked at, like that big, beautiful one in Rick's front yard. This one is growing in one of the, the, the toughest sites you could possibly imagine. So this photo was taken up on Manitoulin Island in a fairly remote area um, called Belanger Bay. And this is basically growing right out of pure limestone pavement. So right out of pure rock, it found a little crack of soil to reach into, it's, it's, it's uh, obtaining some moisture. This site will flood in the spring and in the heat of summer, it will get blazing hot. So sometimes close to 40 degrees, 50 degrees Celsius at the surface on really hot sunny days. And this is surviving in that site. So that's an amazing plant that if you bring it out and give it a little bit more love, and a little bit more water and put it in a garden space, it can actually be a very, very beautiful flowering shrub. And this is again, great to know. If you're in Guelph, this is a fantastic species to choose. Um, pollinators love it, birds love it, it's tough, it's durable, it can handle our, our higher pH soils. And when you give it a nice garden space, it can be absolutely uh, a beautiful specimen such as this. And again, this is actually a fairly large example of this species, which is very different than that tree that was in the front of Rick's yard. So uh, a really uh, important reason to know the difference between those ones. And again, it, it lends to the fact that there's a perfect service berry for every site. I'm going to contrast that one with this species. This is another low service berry. This one's called Amelanchier stolonifera, or sometimes now called Amelanchier spicata variety stolonifera. But if you look at the rock here, this is growing out of pure granite. So this is a little crevice in the rock. It found a little bit of soil and accumulated leaf litter, and it's eking out a living in that really tough site, really acidic environment. Um, you take it out of that environment and you find another uh, site with more acidic soil conditions, but in this case kind of sandy and well-drained and you get this beautiful low patch. So as you can see that this was spreading and it's about a meter tall. That's about as tall as this one gets. And stolonifera means it, uh, it spreads by stolons. So instead of kind of being a single trunk tree, it'll creep along the ground and form this beautiful ground cover that uh, blooms beautifully in the spring. And uh, as you can imagine is, is a boon for pollinators and uh, birds when it turns into berries. So again, um, if I had a cottage, and I know uh, some of you were talking about that before, and it was up on the Canadian Shield, I would choose this species, um, and it will thrive there. If I was planting it in my garden in Guelph, I would choose the previous species, Amelanchier humilis. So again, the value in, in, in seeing the differences between them. And there are some really interesting um, obscure species in Ontario as well. This one's called Amelanchier bartramiana, and it was named after the famous botanist um, John Bartram, who some of you may know Bartram Gardens in Philadelphia, but he uh, has one of the, uh, that garden I should say, has one of the largest remaining Franklinia trees, which is actually uh, now extinct in the wild. So a really beautiful garden space there. This was named in honor of him. It's one of the ones that you can actually tell 
apart uh, fairly easily from the other ones if you look at the right time of year. So if you recall looking at other blooms, um, many of them were much thinner and longer. This one is kind of more rounded. Uh, and also the other really interesting thing about this species is that when the leaves come out of the buds, they come out rolled, whereas all the other species come out of the buds folded. So again, one of those obscure things you'd never think to look at, but if you're there at the right time, you will always know that you're looking at Amelanchier bartramiana because of how the leaves emerge from the buds every spring. This is another really beautiful one, um, and it's actually commonly called beautiful serviceberry. This one is very, very rare in Ontario. Um, it's considered an S1 species, and S1 basically is a ranking that's the rarest of the rare. So something like a sugar maple is considered an S5, for example, and you go all the way down to S1 for things like cherry birches and cucumber trees and, and this uh, a beautiful service berry. And the reason it's called beautiful service berry is because of the size of the petals and the blooms. This is the largest of all the service berry trees. Um, you may recognize the background here. This is our Arboretum greenhouse. So this is one that will be entering our collections and certainly one that we're looking to propagate a little bit more. And again, depending on what you're looking for, you might be planting something for the pollinators and for, for the beauty of the flowers, or you may be planting something because you want to eat them. Um, and it's important to know the difference of species because they have uh, all sorts of different characteristics uh, based upon those things as well. So I'm going to look at the bottom of the second list here for petal size, and you can see Amelanchier ulnifolia, which is often called the Saskatoon berry, has the smallest flowers, but if you look at the top of the flavor rankings, it has the sweetest fruit. So if you are wanting to have a beautiful basket full of service berries every year that you can feed to all your friends, Amelanchier ulnifolia is a good one to choose. Um, and as you kind of move down the list of, of flavor rankings here, you can see that most of them have a degree of sweetness to them and the size varies. Uh, so this, this 10 to 15 millimeters here for Amelanchier lavis, for example, is the average size of the fruit, which is um, certainly bigger than some of the other species like Amelanchier humilis. And then you go way down to the bottom here and you have things like Amelanchier arborea, which has kind of dry and mealy fruit. Um, Bartramiana, which is kind of insipid. So insipid kind of just means tasteless. And then I've found every time I've tasted Amelanchier interior, I don't know how else to describe them except for not good. I have to have a better adjective for that, but, um, but they're not very tasty. And, and I think some of you uh, in the Wednesday morning group in years past have, uh, have tasted some of these different service berries. And actually it was great to have this, the survey results from all of you to uh, determine which ones you felt were the tastiest and, uh, and which ones weren't as well. And then of course, getting into petal size here, we have things like the beautiful service berry, which has very large petals and flowers, and the Allegheny service berry, quite large as well. A few other interesting things to note with the service berries is, um, is when they bloom. So if you're a really big fan of service berries, you can actually plant a number of different species and have the sequence of bloom occur over several weeks. Um, so we're getting close. Last year, the service berries bloomed on May 12th. So when I say they, uh, the first ones were Amelanchier lavis, and I typically use um, some similar trees every year to compare. The year before was April 27th, and the year before that was May 4th. So you can definitely see that they can be a little bit um, fickle depending on the weather. Um, so I, I'm, Polly actually noted the other day when uh, we were chatting about uh, the spring weather this year, how we were we were really lucky to have such a warm start to April, and it's been really kind of cold and miserable since then. Um, but remembering last year in May, how how much later uh, some of the work we were doing was occurring uh, compared to now, and and that phenology or that bloom sequence that we're seeing in the service berries kind of lends to that as well. Um, a few other things to note is that a number of the species have their leaves mostly expanded when they're flowering. So I already showed this photo with the, uh, the beautiful red leaves on Amelanchier lavis when they're blooming um, versus some that are quite closed. And that's another feature when you're comparing them, uh, certainly side by side that you can use to tell them all apart. Now, I'm not sure if many of you will recognize this fellow. This is uh, Dr. RJ Hilton or Bob Hilton, who was the, uh, the uh, inaugural director of the Arboretum back in 1970. And, one of the, uh, the steering committee members who actually founded the Arboretum. And he was a big fan of Amelanchiers, uh, of service berries. Um, 
this is a photo of him actually in retirement, but still working with his passion of service berries here. This is the, uh, a, a individual that he actually purposely coppiced here so that he could collect these nice tall straight twigs and try to grow cuttings from them. And he did a lot of work with service berries over the years doing comparisons. So if you look closely here, you can see RJ Hilton on the clipboard at the top here. Uh, and he's, he's got a couple of different species here for comparison. So in this case, you can look at this one and determine that it's Amelanchier lavis, and this is an Amelanchier canadensis. So again, the leaf emergence is different. Um, the big open clusters of flowers on this one versus the tighter ones here. Both beautiful species in their own way, but slightly different sequencing of timing and some of those other features that, um, that you can certainly note when you look at them side by side. Uh, and this is some of the uh, work that was done in the 80s to uh, evaluate some different ones that he had collected. Um, some of you may recognize this space. It's much different looking now, but this is the what we call the Hort Shade House, which is where we grow a lot of the plant cell plants. So you can look closely, you can see those, those uh, metal poles here <laughs> that um, you'll all walk between you when you're uh, moving the pots around. Now this is what it looked like uh, many, many years before we had plant sales and eventually put tarps on the floor and, and started putting pots in there. But, um, but this, is, uh, this is some of the early work that was done on these plants in the 80s. And many of you will also recognize this fellow. Um, you might rec uh, remember him more so with some gray in his beard, but this is a young Henry Koch with the uh, very dense black beard at the time, uh, evaluating some service berries in the Arboretum Nursery as well. Uh, and this was uh, work that he was doing under, uh, uh, under R.J. Hilton at the time. And uh, lending to another really interesting thing that not a lot of people are aware of is that there is actually a cultivar that's commercially available that was named after Doc Hilton or R.J. Hilton. It's actually called Amelanchier Levis R.J. Hilton. Um, and this is a variety of, again, the Allegheny service berry. And um, it's actually not super well known in Ontario. It is available in the odd nursery, but it's actually quite popular in parts of Europe and in particular the UK. And if you notice at the top here, um, this is the Ro Royal Horticulture Society Award of Garden Merit that was awarded to it in, in 2017 um, because of its, uh, its, its beautiful use for all sorts of garden um, situations. And what makes this particular cultivar very unique was I was showing you all the different service berries with all the white flowers and how similar they may all look. But this one actually opens up to slightly pink blooms. So this is a real rarity. Um, this is a better shot. See it subtly here. This is actually in my bathroom. So I had some, uh, some good, good contrast of, um, of a backdrop here. But you can see those pink petal, petals emerging from this uh, particular cultivar here. And as they open up, the, the pink starts to slowly fade. You can actually see the, the stripes of pink here, but they eventually fade to more of a white color. But again, still have that beautiful backdrop of those kind of um, rusty scarlet colored leaves. And this again is a, a photo of, of R.J. Hilton, and this is the original R.J. Hilton service berry. So he discovered this particular individual in Nova Scotia. Um, and there was evaluations done here at the University of Guelph Arboretum and also the Kent Research Station in Nova Scotia. And when it was finally released uh, from the Kent Research Station, they named it in our, after R.J. Hilton and the rest is history. So we have this um, really, really interesting connection to this um, passionate plant enthusiast uh, who really appreciated animal anchors when uh, not a lot of other people actually took the time to look more closely at them. So um, on that note, as I mentioned, we are getting close to Amelanchier bloom time here at the Arboretum. Uh, we still do have walkthrough access, but we'll certainly make sure to take some photos um, this coming spring to, to share with you all um, as they start to open up as well. And when we all do get back here working, um, do take note of all the service berries that we have throughout our grounds. We have quite an extensive collection of, of many of these different species and something that we're very excited to expand upon in, in the years ahead. So um, 